Happy Friday. John Lorden here. Welcome to your weekly episode of Brain Scratch, and thank you so much for spending some time with me here today. We're going to do it a bit different this week. Obviously, there's a very big topic on everyone's mind, and I'm no exception. Um, I actually originally started working on a completely different case for this week, and I really just had trouble focusing on it. I felt like there was something else that I needed to do specifically for everyone out there this week. Um, and for myself a little bit. So that's really what today's episode is about. And what I figured is uh, I would look into coronavirus and crime because I've been seeing a lot of articles kicking around about how different things are being affected. We're talking about police forces being affected. We're talking about jail systems, even our court systems being affected. We've got certain police departments that are putting out on social media that crime is canceled. Um, even one that had a very bad backlash to the message that they put out that was supposed to be kind of funny or, or trying to make fun of this time. Um, there's actually quite a bit that's going on with coronavirus related crime topics. So we're going to look at a bunch of different stories today. And there's, I think, an important lesson that we're going to get from all this that I'm going to share with you by the end. Um, now, first of all, a lot of places are reporting crime seems to be down, but I'm also seeing some very specific reports of a certain type of crime that is starting to happen, a very unfortunate type of crime. Let's go ahead and start with an article at the New Yorker. The Rise of Coronavirus Hate Crimes, and I want to give a very big thank you to Anna Russell. This is a very well-written piece. It's going to be the first one in the sources down below. Um, if you have extra time today after you watch this video, please hit those sources and read this article, um, but I'm going to share a bit of it with you. On a Monday night in late February, Jonathan Mock was walking down London's busy Oxford Street when he was attacked. He was kicked and punched in the face, a beating that resulted in a bruised and swollen eye the size of a golf ball. Mock is 23 and Singaporean. He had been studying for the last two years at the University of London. The guy who tried to kick me then said, I don't want your coronavirus in my country, before swinging another sucker punch at me which resulted in my face exploding with blood. The Metropolitan Police were called to the scene. They called the incident racially aggravated assault and announced that they had arrested two teenagers, one 16, the other 15 at the time. They were still looking for two additional men. Um, so we're seeing a, a bit of a strange trend around this. And I just have to say in a few of these stories I'm seeing, the trend does seem related to teenagers that are being the aggressors here. So... Um, you know, you have to wonder at that time, is it really about whatever message they think they're trying to send? I mean, are they just trying to bully and harass someone by, you know, accusing them of, of bringing coronavirus to their country or being a carrier or something like that? Or is this just an easy way for them to act out and for them to pick on somebody? Um, I don't know, but I'm hoping that we're going to see a lot of enforcement kind of directed at these types of incidents and maybe some stiffer penalties than we normally would see because um, I really just think that this type of stuff is terribly, terribly unfair. Um, other incidents have emerged. In New York City, on the subway, a man sprayed an Asian passenger with Febreze and verbally abused him. Now, um, I, I had to look into it because the first thing I, I just, it literally made me roll my eyes when I was reading this. Febreze, I don't even think that that kills viruses. Um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's an air freshener. It's, it's not, like, well, I guess some people would think Lysol is an air freshener, but you know that that also kills germs and bacteria. I don't think Febreze falls into that same category. Now, I actually even went as far as trying to do some research on that. The problem is there are so many different types of products that include Febreze that I do think maybe some of those might do that, but I'm pretty sure the can that this guy's carrying uh, is just the straight up Febreze air freshener. And guess what? We can actually see it for ourselves because that video went viral. Um, so here's a clip from a news story about it. Of course, I'll have this in the links down below if you want to check it out also. Um, this guy in the gray and black sweatshirt here 
has the can in his hand and you can see he's already spraying it here at this Asian man that's just standing on the subway and he backs up and keeps spraying it um, the camera's gonna move in a moment there we go just spraying it spraying it spraying it uh, and there's a little more to the clip there you can hear a little bit of the dialogue the, the guy's just like you know what's going on and um, the guy that's spraying him is is telling him, you know, you need to you need to get out of here. You need to get out of my way. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's the kind of stuff that we're starting to see in terms of some crime that's actually starting to uh, peak. You know, uh, apparently in New York they had no hate crimes reported before March, and now we've already talked about one. I've actually got another example we're gonna talk about as well. Um, Mike Ainsworth, the director of London Services at Stop Hate UK, said his organization had seen a spike in hate crimes and incidents reported by Asian communities. There has been, for our help helpline, a significant increase in calls from the Chinese community, he said. The incidents range from name calling, to spitting, that's another thing I'm seeing frequently is people spitting on other people, uh, to someone having been pushed in the road in the path of oncoming vehicles. That kind of sounds like um, uh, maybe an attempted murder charge to me. Uh, so it's it, th these things are just terrible. He also noted an upturn in concern and fear from the Chinese community in London regarding wearing surgical masks. People that would normally wear masks are now feeling that somehow they would become the target of abuse if they continued to do so, he said. In the US, the Anti-Defamation League has also been tracking racist memes and online activity directed toward Asian communities. Uh, it goes into a whole bunch of more information about the types of, I don't even know if you can call it humor at that point. I guess negative humor, just the negativity that is erupting from people um, towards these groups. Uh, in an effort, you know, it's, it's one of those things I used to do stand up comedy. I get that there is, there's, there's a way that you try to approach subject subjects and times where people are, are under stress to kind of help them decompress and, and help them. I mean, right now we've got people that are literally locked up in their homes and they can't go to the movies. Their favorite concerts are canceled. They can't go to their favorite events. The trips that they were planning are canceled. I get that there is a ton of anxiety and buildup around all this, but is a cheap laugh like that really the way to deal with it? Uh, or does that potentially foster some of what we're seeing with you know teenagers running around, um, beating up people? The other story I, I cover, an old man gets kicked in the back. It's just, um, I don't know. If, if, if a joke is helping to contribute to that stuff in any way, I certainly don't think that joke is worth it. And there are plenty of other things that we could be talking about in this world and trying to make fun of to help alleviate uh, the stress and the pressures that we're going through. But um, just trends that we're seeing right now. Ainsworth stressed that hate crimes should be reported to the police, but he also noted that witnesses could help by interacting with the victim to convey a sense of solidarity. I don't expect people to confront perpetrators, but I do expect people to show the victim that they don't agree with what the perpetrators say, he said. And he goes on to talk about, you don't, I mean, you can tell him, like if I was on the subway, subway and I saw that guy doing it, first of all, I don't think that I could stop myself from saying something to that, something to that guy. But if I was in this, this group that he's talking about, people that can't quite act out in that way, I'd certainly be telling the gentleman that was being sprayed, hey man, can you believe this guy? You know, ridiculous. But outside of that, also just opening up and just talking to them about anything. You know, hey, where are you heading to today? Can you believe all this that's going on? You know, I mean, just um, what clothes are you wearing? Where are you going? How are you doing? Um, just anything to treat that person like a human again and to try to help them through what is at a minimum a very embarrassing moment and what is at a maximum a very terrible, terrible moment for them. Um, and there's an interesting point that he raises about this too. I've talked to victims of hate crime in London and one of the things they say is being racially abused on the tube station is horrible, but having 200 people stand there saying nothing is the bit that starts to really upset me and corrode 
my trust in society. And I think that's a, a really terrible aspect to all this, to think about being that person and you're already embarrassed by what's happening and you're probably angry and you're focusing on this person that's doing that to you. But then you also realize you're standing there with dozens of other people and they're just standing there. At least one person was recording it. And even that, in the moment, you might be upset by like, what, this is a joke? You're going to record this and put this on social media? But the truth is, at least by doing that, you might help other people from avoiding this situation. At least maybe they can find that guy and charge him, which at least according to this article, I don't think that they had found him quite yet. But that footage is pretty good. I'm pretty sure someone out there knows exactly who, who that is. And if nothing, you probably know what some of his local commute is because, you know, he, he's on he's on a subway there. So um, finding him again, I don't think would be all that difficult. So the person that stands there recording, I think, is actually serving some type of purpose. But there's a lot of other people that are just standing there and just watching that that nonsense go on. And that's not even the worst of the occurrences that I'm hearing about. Let's roll forward to an article at NewYorkPost.com. Asian man is victim in latest coronavirus-fueled hate crime. An Asian man was kicked in the back and told, go back to his country Tuesday night on Manhattan's Upper East Side. The 59-year-old man told cops he was walking south on Madison Avenue near East 104th Street around 9 p.m., when a teen, once again, we have a teenager acting out, kicked him in the back, causing him to fall to the ground. Effing Chinese coronavirus, the kid barked before telling the victim to go back to his country, according to sources. The man's hands and knees were injured, but he refused medical attention, cops said. The victim told police officers the same teen spat on his face and said, Chinese have coronavirus. The attack happened on the same day a 23-year-old Asian woman was punched in the face in Midtown by a man who was yelling, where is your corona mask, you Asian B-word? It's terrible. Mayor de Blasio addressed recent hate crimes. This is unacceptable. I think all of us would raise our hand to that. Uh, we've talked openly and honestly about the fact that too many hate crimes go unreported, he said. I am beseeching you all to tell the members of your communities that if they are the victims of a hate crime, it must be reported to the NYPD so we can act on it. And I do think, um, I, I think we're not too far off of there being some stiffer penalties for this kind of stuff going on right now. Um, one of the articles we're going to touch on is about kind of refocusing some of the crimes that we're looking at both here in the U.S. and actually over in China. Also, there's a bit of a refocus going on in terms of laws and penalties for those laws. Um, I think that we're going to see a pretty, a pretty strong ramp up of penalties for these types of hate crimes. Now, while we have articles like the last two that are highlighting hate crimes that are going on around all this, it does seem like in some areas we're actually seeing crime drop. In particular, in the Bay Area, in Northern California, they're in a lockdown scenario. So um, things are going a little bit different out there. Let's check out this article at ktvu.com. Coronavirus leads to downturn in Bay Area crime, authorities say. Inmate bookings are down at Santa Rita Jail in Dublin because of the coronavirus pandemic, but that's because the Alameda County Sheriff wants it that way. We've asked local agencies, if you can, cite and release in the field. Do that, said Alameda County Sheriff Greg Ahern. If you have a felony in custody, uh, I believe they might mean felon, uh, please bring them to Santa Rita Jail and we'll process them. The Sheriff's Office is also checking the temperature of inmates and the officers who book them. So there is a new concern that's rising around all this too, and that's in the jails and in the prison systems. If you have a significant outbreak in one of those, what's going to happen? Because you know, social distance, social distancing is a bit hard to do with your inmates when you're stuck in an eight by eight cell or an eight by ten cell. So um, they've got some big concerns around that. We're going to touch on some more of those as we go through this. Having a COVID nineteen case come into our facility that would really cause us a lot of problems at this point," said Ahern. Authorities say crime overall seems to be down with many people staying at home. Across the Bay, San Francisco police reported only one violent crime of note on Tuesday, the first day of the shelter-in-place order. 
A woman was punched and robbed of her bicycle in the financial district. California Highway Patrol is warning drivers not to be tempted by the open roads. CHP officers in Castro Valley stopped one driver who was speeding at 113 miles per hour. So, um, yeah, only one crime of note for an entire day. That first day of the lockdown, pretty interesting. Is the lockdown affecting that? I certainly think so. You've got a lot more people staying at home. There's a couple of other factors we're going to learn about as we go through these articles today. Um, Over at zmescience.com, they're actually asking a very interesting question. With the layoffs that are going to happen from coronavirus, is that going to lead to an increase in crime? So while we're kind of talking about coronavirus right now in terms of the last three articles I've been looking at, this one is thinking a little bit more into the future. And there was a study that was done um, in Norway, and that's kind of what they're pointing to for their theories on this. And here's what their, their conclusions are. The findings were obtained by looking at data from over 1 million laid off Norwegian workers, 84,000 of which experienced experienced an involuntary job loss. The study found a 60% increase in property crime charges in the year after a downsizing and an overall 20% increase in criminal charge rates in the year after a layoff. The researchers said there are no records linking criminal and employment activity in the U.S., but they claim there are reasons to believe that the effects of layoffs would be stronger than in Norway due to differences in society. It does raise an important question. I mean, I know that, you know, there's talk of checks being sent to every citizen, and I I think they're talking about $1,000 or something like that. And let's be realistic. I mean, um, is is that really going to save someone that's just been laid off from their regular employment? There are a lot of people out here that are stringing together multiple part-time jobs to make an income that can take care of their family. Is that check going to cover all that? There's no way. There's no way. So what happens around that? Um, Either there's some other jobs or industries that they have to try to move into. I mean, luckily, there's still a lot of delivery services that are working. So I don't know if those companies are necessarily looking for more drivers, because I would imagine the demand in those areas is kind of going up. But that's still not going to take care of everyone. Um, I, I, I think there is just some plain, clean logic that if layoffs go for an extended period of time, if we're talking about a matter of more than the you know four to eight weeks that we kind of keep hearing knocked back and forth, um, I think we could see a significant rise in crime, particularly when things start returning to, nor- to normal and you have people not being in their houses all the time because then those houses are unoccupied and you've got different robbery opportunities. You've got people that are now traveling, going out into the town. There's different opportunities for different crimes when that kind of stuff happens as well. Um, and certainly, I would think cybercrime. And I would think that people in that game are probably already starting their work right now. So um, I don't think this article is too far off. And I'd be very curious to see some other information on this. If you guys find any other good articles on this particular topic, please include those in the links or in the comments down below so that uh, we could take a look at those together. Over at foxnews.com, a brief touch on what's going on with the justice system, because that's also, of course, being impacted by all this. The U.S. criminal justice system is, along with everything else, experiencing upheaval amid the global coronavirus pandemic. The Supreme Court on Monday Monday suspended all oral arguments in Washington, D.C., including its plans to hear a case involving Trump uh, preventing the release of his tax returns. Other high-profile trials have been postponed, that of real estate heir Robert Durst, who is accused of killing his college best friend in an attempt to cover up his wife's murder decades ago. That trial is going to be rescheduled for a later date in Los Angeles. Uh, Meanwhile, Attorney General William Barr outlined the priorities for the Justice Department. Every federal prosecutor was instructed to prioritize cases related to criminal conduct carried out amid the global coronavirus pandemic including people selling fake cures online for COVID-19 illness, phishing emails from those posing as the World Health Organization or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and malware infecting apps that promise to track the spread of the virus. So you can see already 
at a federal level, the court systems are bracing for, hey, we're going to have a bunch of crimes and we'll put off the other stuff. We need to focus on these right now, uh, almost in a manner to try to protect the public from where we're likely to get hit in a next wave of kind of this, you know, criminals figuring out this coronavirus game and, and how to how to try to game it. Um, the pandemic is dangerous enough without wrongdoers seeking to profit from public panic, and this sort of conduct cannot be tolerated, Barr said in the memo. It is essential that the Department of Justice remain vigilant in detecting, investigating, and prosecuting wrongdoing related to the crisis. At least 27 state court systems had either suspended jury trials, we have that happening here in Minnesota, or imposed restrictions on the number of people who could report to court as of Monday afternoon, the National Center for State Courts, a nonprofit report. Um, I think we're going to see that jump up, and I'm pretty sure most, if not all, of the states will be participating in the same way. So courts are impacted. Um, we've got crime kind of as an overall being impacted. What else is going on? Uh, well, we mentioned it a little bit. We've got the jails being impacted. Mecklenburg begins releasing jail inmates to avoid cell block outbreak of COVID-19. As the Carolinas publicly scramble to limit the spread of the coronavirus, Mecklenburg County's criminal justice system has begun quietly reducing the inmate population at its uptown jail. As of Tuesday, about four dozen of the jail's 1,600 occupants have been scheduled for release part of an ongoing case-by-case -case analysis by judges, prosecutors, and defense attorneys of who needs to be in custody during the emerging pandemic and who does not. More releases are expected in the coming days. So I'm seeing the same thing for um, jails out here, same types of considerations that are going on. And I just want to kind of touch on what what is a trend that I'm seeing in terms of looking up the information that I am for today's video. The trend is there are a lot of variances going on. We have this area doing this, but not doing that. We have that area doing that, but not doing this. So it's very important, I think, right now, particularly if you live in the U.S., because of how our systems work. First of all, our, our states all have their own infrastructure, all have their own rules. But even outside of that, um, the police departments out here, they all operate extremely differently. Um, I think the prison systems are likely to operate a little bit differently from each other as well. So if this is something that affects you, I think it's really important that you understand what's going on with your local area in terms of these policies and what's going on around that. Um, and it's really important in a few ways we're going to touch on as, as we continue here. But uh, I think we're going to see more of this. They're going to look at the people that are in. Maybe if they were supposed to be released within the next six months, they're going to jump them ahead and let them out now. Uh, perhaps they're reviewing the types of crimes that they're in for, taking some of the less hard cases and letting them out. Um, it, it's really a matter of they need to stop this thing from just rampaging through these prisons. There is just a significant health concern when it comes to how people are kept in these jails and prisons. So um, I'm thankful they're looking at it. I know on the flip side, it's like, well, I don't want you guys to just open up the doors and just you know turn them loose. Um, but there has to be something in between. And I think that a lot of states are, are looking to find that. Over at fox17online.com, Bath Township Police cancel crime for coronavirus. And this is a kind of a trend that I've seen happening over the past week when it comes to social media. In a Facebook post, the department said that while officers love catching criminals, they know the illness spreads from human contact. Since putting someone in handcuffs requires physical contact, the department decided it would be best to cancel crime. We suggest everyone who relies on the now canceled criminal activity to seek actual employment, the Post says. So a few different kind of mix up, but that's kind of the same trend. Uh, here's another one from Struthers in Ohio, I believe. Uh, yeah, Ohio. Uh, due to the coronavirus, the police department is asking that all criminal activities stop until further notice. Thank you for your anticipated cooperation in the matter. We will update you when we deem it's appropriate to proceed with Yo Bad Selves. I love it when police departments seem more approachable. And I think this is something that kind of helps in that when there's kind of this tongue in cheek, hey, you know, watch out, bad guys. Um, it, it's just there's there's definitely a balance to that. And once again, we're talking about 
humor and how humor is being used in this time and how people are responding to it. And, um, you know, I think these last two examples weren't too bad, but I've certainly seen some examples that would make you think twice. And the thing is, think about what law enforcement is dealing with. I mean, they're a front line for all of us communities. They're there to try to keep us safe, to help keep us protected. And how do they do that? They're interacting with strangers on a moment to moment basis. Uh, and sometimes people that aren't doing too great in our communities. So there's a big cause for concern. And then you have things like this happen. This is from uh, an article at the Washington Post. According to the Hanover Township Police Department, Leah Piazza wouldn't stop breathing on the New Jersey officers as they were processing her paperwork. When the 28-year-old New Jersey woman crashed her car last week, she grew belligerent and refused to answer questions from officers who believed she might be intoxicated. Oh, by the way, Piazza allegedly said after coughing on one officer, I have the coronavirus and now so do you. I mean, I just, can you imagine having to deal with that? And, and yes, there's a strong probability that she's full of it. Um, but there's also the possibility that she's not. The remark naturally alarmed the Hanover Police Department, which contacted health officials and placed the three officers who had dealt with Piazza under self-quarantine. So already there, if nothing else, even if this is just uh, her acting up or another attempt at humor of some kind, three officers now not able to go do the job that we need them to do because of what she said to them. While Piazza claimed that her boyfriend had contracted the novel coronavirus and was hospitalized for treatment in New York, that was 100% false. Hanover Police Captain Dave White told NewJersey.com, the man in question said that he'd only been on one date with her and that his hospital stay was for an unrelated tooth issue. Piazza, who couldn't be located for comment, but reportedly called police on Friday and apologized for her outburst, was charged with DWI, careless driving, reckless driving, refusal to take a breath test, and false public alarm. But law enforcement officers across the country worry that at some point it could be more than just a scare. Uh, definitely. And I get it. And I think we all need to be mindful of that. And if you have an officer in your family, please, um, first of all, tell them how much we appreciate them. And outside of that, um, tell them to be safe out there. I mean, this I, I can't imagine that that is your regular job at a time like this. Um, it's got to be tough to deal with. And the pressures that we feel being stuck at home, imagine uh, what it feels like to be out there and not knowing who you're interfacing with from one moment to the next and then having some woman coughing on you and saying, oh, by the way, I just gave you the coronavirus. It's, it's terrible. Now, another trend that I'm seeing is police departments that want to defer you to other services for certain types of crimes. Uh, here's an article from LansingStateJournal.com. Lansing police won't be responding in person to most property crimes due to coronavirus. In order to protect officers and community members during the COVID-19 outbreak, LPD will not respond in person to take reports on the following crimes. Larceny, malicious destruction of property, and retail frauds with no suspect or evidence or where the value is under $1,000. Attempted breaking and entering of unoccupied buildings, including garages and foreclosed houses. Identification thefts where the victim was not financially harmed or the financial institution has reimbursed the victim for the loss. Fraud of unauthorized credit card use when the venue of the crime is outside Lansing. Harassing communications lost property. Um, I'm kind of curious about the harassing communications. I don't think they're talking about the same type of hate crimes that we were talking about at the start of this video. I think they mean, you know, someone being abusive on a phone call or an email or, or something along those lines. Dispatch will direct the community to complete property crime reports online. All crimes will still be investigated. So essentially, they're not going to send an officer to your house to do the report because they're trying to limit exposure for the officers. But there are usually online portals or other places where you can go and you can put that information in, essentially starting the report. And then they're saying supposedly all crimes will still be investigated after that fact. Um, and of course, police will still respond in person to all calls involving violent crime. 
So on top of how you report crimes being different, also the police departments are treating certain crimes differently. We already touched on it on one article a little bit, but here's another example from Chicago. In Chicago, the police department has told officers that certain crimes can be handled via citation and misdemeanor summons as opposed to physical arrest. The measures, officials explained, are intended to protect not just the police and sheriffs who come into contact with citizens, but limit crowding in jails that could lead to rapid spread of the virus among vulnerable populations. Sheriffs around the country also raising alarm about the potential crisis of the virus entering local jails, the majority of which do not have in-house medical care. What a nightmare that could be if they had a breakout in one of those facilities that doesn't have medical care. I don't even know how they treat that at that point. I know in previous cases I've covered, sometimes someone will get hurt um, at a jail or around a jail. One particular case, someone was trying to escape from the jail. And essentially for their medical services, they have to take them to local hospitals. Well, I'm pretty sure our local hospitals are already pretty busy. So can you imagine all of a sudden having to contact a local hospital and say, hey, I've got 300 people here that we think are infected with this thing. I just, um, the, the strain on the system is, uh, you know, it's kind of scary to think about. But then there's also now this message that you're putting out to criminals about the fact that, hey, you know, certain things that you would be arrested for before, yeah, you might not be arrested for them now. You know, we're going to give you a citation and we're going to, give you a summons to appear in court. And, you know, there's a lot of guys that would take those, crumple them right up and throw them over their shoulder. Uh, the prospect of departments announcing that certain crimes will not lead to arrest has caused alarm among some in the law enforcement community. It sends a message out to criminals that you've got a free pass right now while all this is going on, which is the wrong message to send, said the executive director of the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association. Of course, all this concerns over exposure, and I think you're seeing law enforcement agencies trying to address exposure is issues, which is tough for them because law enforcement's job is to interact with people, particularly suspects, and be out on the streets. So he's even noting that despite the fact it's a terrible message to be putting out to criminals, there is an obvious problem when it comes to law enforcement and exposure to them. Um, that's certainly a service that I don't want to see go down either. So... Um, there's just there's a lot of very strange lessons that we're trying to learn in all this and a lot of new places where we haven't had to go to before. I think so many of us have been so comfortable for a long time with how certain systems have been set up and how they've been working, particularly around uh, law enforcement and crime and government. And now we're having to look at all these policies and things and say, hey, look, we can't do it quite that way right now. So we need to figure out some adjustments. We need to figure out maybe some new different systems or some new different processes. And we have to do it on the fly because we've, we've got no time to prepare. It's here. So a lot of big challenges that are going on with these conversations all around the country and around the world. Uh, jumping over to dailynews.com, what's happening in Los Angeles? Uh, they are also urging residents to use an online system to notify police of non-emergency crimes. And Los Angeles, that's a huge metropolitan area. We're talking millions and millions of people. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, they can't just call up LAPD and say, hey, I need someone to come over and to take a police report. Now all of that's being funneled to these online systems. Um, once again, they're pointing out incidents such as harassing phone calls, lost property, theft of property from a publicly accessible location like a car or a porch, vandalism, or illegal dumping. All of that is now supposed to be reported online. And once again, I'm just trying to highlight with you guys how important it is that you know what's going on in your current area because if you know you walk out to your front yard and your car has been broken into, do you know the answer right now? If you're supposed to call 911 or you're supposed to go to an online portal, do you expect that a cop's going to be able to come out and take a report? The truth is, depending on what state you're in and then even what city you're in within those states, there could be very big differences. So you might want to take a little time and just at least at least at a minimum keep your ear to the ground with media for your local law enforcement and what their policies are because if you need it uh, you're not going to want to go hey i got to go to google and i got to look up some articles and spend the next two hours trying to figure out what i'm supposed to do um, so it might be safer to, to do that footwork ahead of time 
also from LA, they are noticing the same kind of trend that we were hearing about in the Bay Area. Overall, crime is down 5.8% so far this year through March compared to the same time last year. Crime will probably decline as people change their routines, said UC Irvine criminology professor George Tita, who is a part of an inter disciplinary group working studying the effect of the coronavirus on crime trends in LA. I would love to have a conversation with uh, Mr. Tita or Professor Tita. Uh, with residents working from home and avoiding restaurants, bars, and gyms, there is less potential for street crime. With so many people staying in their homes, burglaries and property crime could decline while spousal abuse incidents may increase, Tita said. Another very important thing to think about in all this how many cases have we looked into over the past five years of brain scratch that have been domestic violence related? There could be some rises in those types of crimes as well. Um, thankfully, at least, and, and I wish I could say this, I wish we had the same system working all over the country so I could just say, hey, we've got this in place. Unfortunately, that's not how it works here. But for Ventura County, uh, where I actually I used to live, local help for crime victims still available during coronavirus outbreak. Uh, in a time of stay in place orders and closed public spaces, Ventura County groups that provide services for people in abusive relationships are still offering help. The Coalition for Family Harmony, Interface Children and Family Services, and the Ventura County Family Justice Center are working. Each agency helps a vulnerable population. Among the populations are victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, elder abuse, and child abuse. They're, bas they're basically shifting to online counseling, uh, either over the phone or through video conference, and they are still keeping their shelters open for those experiencing domestic violence or people who are in rape crisis. Um, so great organizations having to make adjustments, but still figuring out way to provide those crucial and critical services to these populations that are going to need them through all this. Yes, we can shut down our movie theaters. Yes, we can you know shut down our gyms, but can we shut down our shelters for people that are in domestic violence situations and rape situations. I just, I, I don't see how we do that. So I'm thankful that there's good people figuring those things out as well. So while certain parts of California have this stay in place lockdown situation going on, I think they're talking about that for New York as well. Um, we've got some places that are speaking up pretty strongly and once again, showing a trend towards we're going to be quite a bit tougher about things directly applying to coronavirus. We're not playing around. Maryland law enforcement prepared to arrest people who defy coronavirus shutdown. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan issued an executive order Monday to shut down all bars, restaurants, movie theaters, and gyms in Maryland effective at 5 p.m. to slow the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. Restaurants may continue delivery, carry out, and drive through services. Hogan also ordered limiting gatherings to 50 people applies to social, community, religious, and recreational or sports activities. Um, out here, we're hearing 10 people, um, but I don't know if this is a different classification because they're talking about, um, I think they're trying to talk about, hey, you can get enough people together you know, to have a church service. Maryland State Police Superintendent Colonel Woodrow W. Jones III said the department will work to enforce those orders around the clock and across the state. He said his department is prepared to arrest business owners, customers, and citizens who ignore the governor's instructions. Violation of governor's executive order declared during a state of emergency is punishable with a fine of up to $5,000 or one year in jail or both, Jones said in a statement. I certainly think we're going to see more of this. I think in areas where they have uh, lockdowns issued or stay in place orders that are issued, uh, at a minimum, we're going to have law enforcement making stronger statements like this. It's kind of weird because with all the information we've reviewed on today's episode, it sounds like they're saying, hey, we can't just bring a bunch of people into jail. As a matter of fact, we're trying to figure out who to let go. So, you know, are they going to knock on the the door of your local bar and go in there and count up and say, hey, you've got, you know, 51 people in here. You guys are all coming to jail? Probably not. 
Um, but if there's a hefty fine that's they're able to be cited for, that might be enough to deter it. And I'm hoping it is. I hope that it doesn't get to the point where they have to really get crazy about these arrests and stuff like that. Of course, the best situation is if people would just cooperate. And that's one thing that I've seen even in my circle of family and friends is there is um, kind of this initial denial thing that a lot of us go through. Ah, it's not that important. It's not going to affect me anyway. I'm young enough. I can get through this or whatever. Um, and there's kind of a curve where people are getting to, oh, okay. You know, maybe it's as they learn more about it. I see what we're trying to do. You know, we can't slam all the hospitals at the same time. I care about my neighbors. I don't want the guy across the street, you know, dying because he's over 60. And I decided that I had to go out for a bike ride or do something like that. So I recognize that there is a bit of a curve that everyone is going through and denial just seems to be an early stage in all this. Um, but hopefully we don't have to be forced to go into that through these types of measures like we're hearing about in Maryland where they're, they're having to really strong arm um, people through the media like this. But we'll, I don't know. They're going to do what they need to do. So if, if more of that's needed, I'm sure more of that is coming. What about China? What about where this all started? We got an interesting story from the LA Times from there. A woman who flew last week from Massachusetts to Los Angeles, then to Beijing, where she tested positive for coronavirus, is under investigation on allegations of concealing her symptoms and putting fellow travelers at risk of infection. Apparently, um, they must now be asking, because this article says that she took uh, medication to get her fever down and then literally lied to flight attendants uh, about being sick. Uh, the woman who was hospitalized and is receiving treatment is under investigation for the crime of impeding prevention of infectious diseases. According to Chinese law, she could face up to three years of imprisonment or detention with possible forced labor or up to seven years of prison if there are serious consequences. Uh, she was on a flight, I'm sure, with 150 or more other people. Um, now you've got all those people that have to get checked and who did they come into contact with and they have to get checked. I mean, it's just, it's a huge ripple effect here. And to know that someone knowingly did that is just, it blows my mind. While Chinese diplomats and propaganda authorities have boasted in recent weeks of China's victory over the coronavirus and its superiority to other countries' responses, doctors and scientists warn that a resurgence of cases is possible as people return to work and others fly back home to China from abroad. On Monday, a joint statement on strengthening border health and quarantine work was issued by China's highest court, the prosecutor general, and other officials. They identified six crimes tied to national health and quarantine measures, including refusal to implement quarantine measures, such as medical inspection and temperature monitoring, reporting false information on health declaration forms, hiding one's disease symptoms, or refusing to accept customs health checks. Wang Jun, Director General of Customs Policies and Regulations, said the crimes are serious threats to public health and safety. So once again, we're seeing a little bit of this here in the States already. Now we're hearing China cracking down on this very sharply. They're identifying uh, new laws and new types of charges for people that are going against the orders that have been issued to try to curb coronavirus. At least 25 other people in China have been punished or investigated for concealing their coronavirus symptoms or travel history. A man took a train with his son but claimed that they had been home for the last 40 days. They tested positive for coronavirus. 900 others had to be quarantined as a result. He was sentenced to one year in prison. Two women reportedly lied about having traveled back to China. They decided they wanted to go out, eat at several restaurants. They were charged with impeding prevention of infectious diseases and put under forced isolation and observation. Um, so I think we're going to see more of that. Uh, I think we're going to see different laws apply to different levels. There might be some federal ones that kick in and then the local states say, hey, for us specifically, we're doing this. And then maybe it would get down even smaller than that to city level for very specific things. Um, I don't know, but this is where we're at right now. Like I said, I think the biggest takeaway from today's video is to learn about what's going on in your immediate area try to be as helpful as possible. I don't know what side of the curve that you're on personally, 
um, in terms of coming to grips with the possibility of being put on lockdown effectively, like we're seeing in some parts of the country. Um, but I think your I think your communities are worth it. I think your neighbors are worth it. The people that are trying to fight this off, the people that are front line in terms of law enforcement, uh, the people that are front line in terms of hospital staff, uh, they deserve the consideration and anything that we could do to help them. I think personally is is the right thing to do. But I know you guys probably have a lot of different thoughts on that. Let's talk about that in the comments down below. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you so much for hanging out with me here today. Uh, before I go, just a couple of quick thank yous to new patrons, Madison Willoughby and Tessa. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. If you'd like to do the same, head over to www.lordandarts.com. I'll see you on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked right here on the Lord and Arts channel.